Hello, and welcome to episode 75 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We are here today with Lou Peck of Bethesda Magazine. Lou, how are you doing today? Good. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Glad to have you. So the first question I'd like to pose to you is, what are you currently doing, or what have you ever done to advance the public interest, and why? Well, I like to think that my uh, almost 50 years in journalism have all been to uh, advance the public interest. Uh, I think throughout my career, while I've reported on government and politics at the local, state, and national level, uh, clearly I think what I've always tried to do is to uh, hold large public and private institutions accountable. And I think uh, that uh, is what I think just about any journalist who specializes in what I do, what he's seeking to do. Sure. So holding public institutions accountable at the state, local, and national levels, how did that come to be something that interested you? How did you get down this career path? Well, probably a a couple of things. Number one, um, well, my father, my father was a journalist. Huh. And uh, while I don't think he, he didn't, he never pressured me to go into journalism. If anything, he probably would have been happier, but become a lawyer, uh-huh. uh, I think the, his influence was certainly, certainly had an impact. I certainly, as I was growing up, remember he worked for the New York Times, going to the New York Times, seeing the old composing room. Huh. Uh, composing rooms are an, <laughs> an antiquated notion in this day and age, but back in those days, that's where you put the paper together. Uh, oh. Uh, you know, now, of course, it's all done on computer. So that was part of the reason. The other, The other thing that motivated me was that I've always had a, Great, great interest in, uh, in government and politics. Uh, probably at some point fairly early on, I decided I probably wasn't suited to run for office. So I did the next best thing. I uh, mm-hmm. I watched those who ran for office. Same way, my, my father was somewhat the same way. He, I think, had ambitions early on to be an actor. Decided early on that that was probably not in the cards. So to did the next best thing. He spent his, most of his career reporting and. Uh, editing on arts and leisure and, uh, and the theater. Did you ever pursue, perhaps not elected office, but involvement in your local homeowners association board or anything in that light where you wouldn't have to be on a public ballot? Uh, that's exactly. In fact, the one office since I ran for president of my high school, uh, now 50, almost 50 years ago, the one office I've hel- held is exactly that, a homeowners association. Uh, mm-hmm. My wife and I have a... Uh, weekend home on uh, the Eastern Shore. It's a private community, and I spent six years on the board of the Homeowners Association where it was strictly a, a nonpartisan ballot, and uh, it was a show of hands at the annual meeting. It was, uh, right. it was nothing very formal. And uh, how, have you enjoyed serving on the HOA over in the Eastern Shore? Um, it's had its ups and downs like all public office. Uh, Does it give you some perspective on what you've been doing, I guess, from the other side, even though on a totally different level? Um, g- given the scale, I'm not sure how much perspective it gives me in terms of being, you know, the person who normally is covering people in that kind of position, only because, uh, we, you know, this is a community of 110 houses as opposed to sure. here <laughs> or even the local level, you know, when you're dealing with somebody at the county council or delegate level, you're dealing with somebody with thousands of uh, constituents. I think what probably has given me more of a Mm -hmm. perspective of what it's like to be running for office or serving in office is, uh, I think increasingly, as I get on in years, people seem to want, seem to want me to uh, come up on stage and talk about various issues or talk about my uh, perspective on, you know, on the, the situation to be it here in Montgomery County or elsewhere, and I have found that being up on a stage uh, sort of puts me under the same kind of pressures that I'm usually putting people under that kind of pressure when I'm out in the audience asking questions instead I'm up on stage and they're in the audience asking questions. And how does that make you feel to kind of reverse from being a journalist where you're actually putting a spotlight on someone else and you're 
writing about someone in the spotlight to being in the spotlight. And then almost it's interesting that in being a journalist and writing about others who are in the public spotlight, you become a leader in your own right in the field of journalism and people ask you to speak. Could you reflect on that? Sure. It's, a, it's funny because I was actually at a, uh, um, as, a, as a bit of an aside besides what I do here at uh, Bethesda Magazine and some other writing that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm part of a group right now that is uh, trying to start a statewide publication in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And we recently had a uh, had a gathering where I had to get up and speak. And I won't name who it was, but somebody who's a fairly prominent office holder uh -huh. was out there in the audience continually critiquing me and telling me that, <laughs> you know, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. <laughs> It, it may be very self-conscious of, of the kinds of, and I, I'm sure, you know, obviously as people who are in public life do it more and more, mm -hmm. it becomes more second nature, but I haven't done it enough so it becomes second, that it's become second nature, and therefore I'm, when I'm in that situation, I'm invariably nervous. Interesting, because has it affected your writing at all and the way that you cover politics, given that you now have a slight appreciation for what it is to be publicly critiqued in front of... Um, I'm not sure that, that, that that's changed my writing. I think over the years, uh, and I think this probably goes for just about any journalist, uh, love-hate love -hate relationship may be too strong a word, mm -hmm. but, you know, but I think there is something of that kind of relationship between journalists and, uh, and the politicians they cover. And I say that from the standpoint that on the one hand, there are going to be inevitable clashes and tensions because obviously people running for office or in office would, would love to have all coverage reflect how positive effect, yeah. positively on them and a journalist clearly is not writing for the person they're covering they're you know they're writing for a broader audience and have an obligation to the reader but at the same time i think that uh that doesn't mean that people in journalism and uh and people who are in politics can't be friends and i certainly while i've had, 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 I certainly had differences with a lot of people I cover. I also, at the same time, regard them as, as friends. I think they realize, however, that push comes to shove, I'm going to call them as the call as I see them. I say all that sort of as a run-up to the fact that uh, uh, I've, I admire the dedication of most politicians. You know, the, it's interesting because uh, at our place on the Eastern Shore, it's obviously a very different kind of place in Washington where government is, you know, is so dominant. A lot of people there just sort of look upon Congress and they're the 80-some-odd they're the percent of America who thinks that Congress is worthless and doing a lousy job. And I, you know, I, I always and barely have to say to them, I said, look, I said, Congress is elected by the people. It reflects the population. Mm -hmm. And in gener in, uh, by and large, the said there, uh, there are crooked people in Congress, yes. There are crooked because there are crooked people <clears throat> in the population a little bit large. Are there venal people in Congress, yes. But I said, by, by and large, it's like the bulk of the population are decent, hardworking folks who try to do the right, the right thing. So are most members of Congress. And when you look at members of Congress, for that matter, the legislature or the county council, these are all people who basically, you know, it, you know m most of the year work seven days a week. It's you know it's it's not something with it that they're doing a few hours a day, a few days a week, and that's it. And, so and that, that I respect. I'd like to pivot on that yeah. point. Yeah. That the point that you made that many Americans that Congress has a very low approval rating nationally. Yeah. Many, many Americans will have a low opinion of Congress as a body, mm -hmm. though many Americans also have a higher opinion yeah. of their own congressmen. My question is, the, well, concerning the role that the media plays in that, and my specific question is, you know, you find that when you read about politicians, oftentimes it's quite negative because they've stepped over a line somehow. They've acted in an ethically um, uh, incorrect way, an immoral way. They've, there's some corruption or some kind of scandal. And as you mentioned, the majority of politicians in the nation, and in well, at least let's just talk about the United States, the majority of politicians are in it for the right reasons. They work hard. They're responsible. They do they answer their constituents' calls. They do their legislation. They do their work. And they give a lot of themselves. Um, but that isn't covered because that isn't news, right? You know, it's not going to have a headline that says, 
by the way, this local official called a delegate that you don't even know what that is has been responsible for the last three months answering calls and doing his job because that's boring. So my question is, why is it that, you know, the majority, that, that, that politicians doing them, their job is boring and is not exciting? Why is that not news? What role does the media play in, in having a bias that the only time the public hears about the politician is negative? So, you know, should yeah. the press start writing about what was previously considered to be a boring story? Uh, I'm not sure that every, you know, everything that the press writes about uh, politicians is negative. You know, yes, it's sort of, the, it's sort of human nature. Mm -hmm. you, know, you think of the person talking over the backyard fence. Right. You know, they're not going to say, gee, you know, I baked a lovely cake today. They're probably going to say, gee, you hear the Mrs. So-and-so yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> down, the, down the road and what she did, that kind of thing. So, uh -huh. you know, I, I, think that, I think that somewhat applies to news. I think what you talked about is interesting, the fact that there is such a disconnect, particularly in the case of Congress, between the opinion of Congress as a whole and the fact that a lot of people tend to like their legislative, their, their individual legislator. I think there are a couple of things that play into that. Number one, is the, and it's the reason that I think particularly in TV you see the presidency cover so much and Congress not as much. Congress is sort of a 535-person body. It's something very hard for the average person to sort of get their arms around, where mm -hmm. the president is one person, a very powerful person, but it's easier to focus on. And so... That's very different than, say, focusing on your individual member of Congress, who mm -hmm. you may have seen speak to a Rotary Club or something, who may have, whose staff may have helped your mother with Social Security benefits. And so I think in a lot of cases it's going to be, oh, yeah, I saw him speak, or oh, yeah, he helped my, you know, my mother with Social Security benefits. He's a nice guy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the rest of those bums, but bums is sort of the yeah. I say bums is the attitude that I, I you know that a lot of voters have. They can't get anything right. They can't do anything, and that's where I think you get the disconnect between the member of Congress, who's the real person you see, and this sort of humongous five hundred and thirty-five member body that you. It's harder to get your arms around. So my real question, and and I'm and it's kind of going in two directions here, is is what is the responsibility of the press yeah. when it comes to politics and, and democracy. And, and obviously you mentioned one earlier, which is to hold power accountable. And later I'd like to ask you about, you know, in holding power accountable, how you see yourself uh, like holding a legislature accountable different than see the executive or the judiciary holding the legislative branch accountable. And on the other hand, I wanted to ask your responsibility to inform, yeah. right? And so is it a news story if your local county council member speaks at a rotary club about, you know, uh, a stream cleanup is, you know, which is less exciting than, you know, some other kind of more negative story. So, so if you can reflect first on, on education, on the general role of the media, and then we'll move back into checks and balances. Um, look, you know, I, as I said, I don't think the media sort of go, you start the day saying, gee, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to try to dig up dirt on somebody. Uh, as I said earlier, it's sort of human nature to gravitate to bad news as opposed to good news. That having been said, you know, the example of covering a member of, uh, of the, of the uh, county council or a local official who's speaking about a stream cleanup at, uh, at, a, uh, at a rotary club, you know, I think a whole, a whole series of things go into that. You know, it, is that stream cleanup important to a particular chunk of the readership that you may be serving? If it is, it's worth covering. It may be worth covering. Mm -hmm. Is it newsworthy? You know, mm -hmm. is, it, is this person simply, is this something that may have been ongoing and there's just not much news there and this person is going there to try to beat their, to blow their horn and try to take credit for things mm -hmm. without really moving the ball forward in the sense of new developments or is somebody going to make that speech and, and going to lay out a plan for saying, gee, this is what we need to do to clean up that stream. So, you know, I think the latter is going to be far more newsworthy than the former. So it's, it's not a question of whether something necessarily is good news or bad news. It's a question of what the news value and what the value of that information is to the reader. Now, I just want to reflect on the, the guest all for a minute, yeah. which is to say that if the real story is that the overwhelming majority of politicians are responsibly doing their job in an ethical fashion. Yeah. 
and the impression based upon the n frequency of articles covering politicians tends to skew negative, mm -hmm. then maybe the press isn't getting the full story. They're focusing on the 5% and missing the 95%. Yeah. So I know you mentioned that it has to appeal to your readership, yeah. but you know, to what extent do you think the press ought to be covering the real story, which is most of them are doing positive? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think it's something else we need to talk about here. Is it was you talk about the press, you know, we're, we're sort of assuming that the press is, the press is almost sort of a monolithic mm -hmm. kind of, and you know, it, in past years, it may be more monolithic than it is right now, and that everybody's going to sort of be reading the same, you know, the, the same newspapers and the same journals. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, clearly right now, you have a situation where, number one, mm -hmm. you have a media industry that, which had a certain economic model that worked for 125 years. The Internet sort of blew that apart, and the, and the so-called legacy media are trying to find the answer. Okay, you know what? What, what's going to work going forward. The problem right now is that you basically have increasing, you have a very balkanized electorate, mm -hmm. uh, and one can argue to what degree the media is responsible for that, to what degree that the media is sort of following, it, 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 you know, following a broader split in society. Mm -hmm. But you obviously, you know, on a, on a national level where in a previous era, people of all kinds of ideologies might have been reading, say, the same publications. Mm -hmm. Now I think increasingly you find that people of different ideologies read different publications. And so all I'm saying is that, you know, we're talking about the obligations in the media here. One thing that I find frustrating is, you know, people like me are trying to do accountability journalism, mm -hmm. and there's a large ch chunk of the public that, you know, I don't want to get in detail in the 2016 election, mm -hmm. but I think that, that's a good example. There, is, there was clearly a very large chunk of the Donald Trump electorate mm -hmm. that, regardless of what certain media outlets might have reported about him, mm -hmm. was simply not going to believe it. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, you now have problems cropping up. You've probably read about them recently, these so-called fake news sites, mm -hmm. you know, where people are believing stuff they see on the internet, which is just made up out of whole cloth, uh, which I think gets the problem. The internet is sort of the wild, wild west, and you don't have editors who are making the kind of judgments that in the old days where newspapers were dominant, you had editors who decided this is news, this is not, this is ready for publication, this isn't. So and when we talk about how the media influences opinion, and whether you know that it's a influencing opinion negatively or influencing opinion positively, mm -hmm. I think you know it's a it's a legitimate question, but it's you know it's not going on in a vacuum, particularly in this day. There's and age. a lot of media that exists outside of journalism, is what you're saying. Uh, increasingly, in this day and age of the of the decline of the so-called legacy media, mm -hmm. you know, which in one way may be a good thing because in the old days, in order to really if you will get the you know in order if you, if you to be a media owner a media publisher mm -hmm. you had to have a lot of money you had to have a printing press yeah. you had to have a paper now all you need is you an know, iPhone it, it is a computer and an iPhone a lot and, lower barrier to entry now yeah the, the the bad news is what i said earlier you know when it was all newspapers clearly it was a very structured environment mm -hmm. where certain kinds of news that clearly was not ready for print that might not have been confirmed. There was an editor saying, no, it's not going out there until you can confirm it. Now this stuff just crops up on the Internet. On the other hand, you do have citizen journalism that leads to things such as the Arab Spring yeah. or the police brutality yeah. capturing on cell phones, yeah. Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. So there is yeah. a positive documentary oh. that circumvents um, any kind of censorship. Yeah. No, and, and absolutely. You know, I, I'm not arguing that we should go back to the days of pre-Internet and pre-social media. There's, mm -hmm. There is no question that you know, just in the, in terms of social media, I mean, something like Twitter, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it's, as somebody said to me recently, it's probably the best newswire going right now in hmm. terms of just keeping up with stuff. And it also, uh, social media has made public feedback a lot more, a lot easier than it was when, 
in the days were okay if you really wanted to to write a whole letter to the editor uh, editor the editor which is a far, a far higher barrier yeah so I know I'm not talking about that kind of communication between people I'm talking about it's just a muddying of what's true uh, of what's true what's news what's not news uh, you know and again you know the the opinion the difference between what is really a news outlet on you know, online, and what is somebody, and what is somebody who's simply blogging mm -hmm. and sort of, if you will, spouting their opinions mm -hmm. and not doing, and not going out and doing what we would have called in the old days shoe leather reporting, actually going out and talking to people. Uh, but uh, so, so, so as I said, this is a, it's obviously a somewhat different topic, but I think it all informs the issue of how of positive, negative, how the media affects public opinion. So on a, returning to the topic of accountability yeah. and yeah. considering social media, it seems that social media both can increase accountability with the examples I just gave, yeah. but also can diminish accountability by putting so many distractions out there. You can't tell true from false, and yeah. whereas there used to be a source of information that was true and that could hold someone accountable, now it's just drowned out by information that isn't true, and therefore you get lost in the, in the shuffle and, and yeah. this power is, is held to accountability less well than maybe before. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, as, I, as I said, there are, there are it'd be clearly, it's, it's not a st straightforward answer of good and bad there. There are some mm -hmm. very good things to social media and the internet, but you know, the flip side, well, give me a good, a good example. Uh, in the middle of my career, I, I covered several presidential campaigns, mm -hmm. and this happened in the era before this was the 1980s. There were no cell phones. For which publication? Uh, the Gannett newspapers. Okay. Uh, which, you know, uh, which USA Today had just started at okay. that point. But it, it's, uh, they also owned about 90 papers across the country. So they were, and I think still are, the biggest newspaper chain, uh, or at least one of the biggest. But in any event, so I, I went out to, uh, I would cover you know, the campaign. Mm -hmm. In those days, there were no, you know, there was no email. There were no cell phones. Right. Uh, you know, any, anything like that. There was no social media. Basically, you came by, you, you heard a story first thing in the morning. Yeah. You essentially had all day to try to report it out, if you will, because uh -huh. there was no ready way to get it out until the next day's paper or, right. the, or the evening news that night. On the one hand, there was less immediacy in terms of the news. On the other hand, it gave people a chance to really delve into these stories, and many of these stories that crop up in the morning, by the evening, when, they, when it came time to publish, were not news because they just sort of collapsed to their own weight. Uh -huh. The problem right now in this day and age of, uh, of social media and the internet and pressure to publish right now or else somebody else is going to get the story is, is I think a lot of stories get up online that are, are not ready for publication, that have not been thoroughly confirmed. And, and, and personally, you're actually doing, you're taking action to remedy this, right? You're creating an investigative journalism body in Montgomery County with a few other journalists yeah. to, to, to address this issue? Well, well it, it's, actually state, it's actually statewide. It's state, Maryland. Uh, it's statewide. It would focus heavily, uh, uh, called Maryland Matters, it would focus heavily on the... Uh, uh, on the state legislature, but when the state legislature was not in session, mm -hmm. it would obviously focus on major jurisdictions such as Montgomery County, Prince George's, but also on a lot of the state government bureaucracy, which right now is undercovered. Uh, what what that is is to some degree, it's not only an attempt to practice what I would call sort of traditional mainstream accountability journalism, mm -hmm. uh, particularly given the fact that the economic model of the so-called legacy media has been collapsing. You know, all, you, all you need to do is look at the Washington Post today and look at the Washington Post a few years ago. It's a lot thinner. More and more of it's going online. So because, you're trying to basically recreate an investigative journalism bureau yeah. in, on, in its own right. Yeah. Well, uh, when you say investigative journalism, you need to be a little bit careful because invest investigative journalism sort of conjures up Watergate and people who spend months and months in a given story. How would you describe this new venture? I, I would I would basically call it accountability journalism, in the sense that it would it would be designed to on a day in day out basis uh, cover stories thoroughly and fairly, but also cover a lot of stories that are not now being covered by existing media because particularly in this day and age among the existing media because of the finance the economic pressures. Mm -hmm coverage at the local, state and 
and local level have, have, have shrunk. And would this be audio, visual, or read, and would it be exclusively online? It would be exclusively online. It would be uh, various platforms. You know, obviously it would be, you know, in-depth reporting. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of breaking news, but certainly, uh, if not immediately, eventually there would be a significant visual element in terms of a web TV kind of uh, situation. Two more questions. Sure. Just since you said this is an accountability venture, I just want to ask yeah. you for a minute to consider how this venture and journalism in general has yeah. held a legislative branch or an executive branch yeah. or, you know, um, to, to uh, accountable yeah. for their actions yeah. in, in, as, as a fourth estate, a check and balance on government yeah. compared to the other three branches of government checking and balancing each other. How is it similar or different than, you know, journalism uh, holding holding accountable legislature versus a, a governor holding accountable the state legislature? You mean in terms of what? Checking the power or, yeah. or hold? yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's different kinds of accountability. I mean, certainly a, a president or a governor mm -hmm. is going to, hold a legislature accountable from the standpoint, and certainly you... you know, to put a veto there. Well, there's a veto in terms of blocking stuff, yeah. but at the same time, there's also jawboning. You know, every You could time, punish him. You could say, look, I'm not giving you your capital budget request. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, 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 certainly you've seen President Obama on many occasions in the last year or two get up there and say, and, and excoriate Congress for not doing this or that. Right. He's obviously appealing to a... Broader audience using his bully of, pulpit. Uh, it's a bully pulpit, you know. It's a, you know, I guess in the LBJ's day they used to call it jawboning, but yeah, they're, <laughs> using, they're using a bully pulpit to try to talk over Congress to the people, hoping then the people are going to pressure exert, exert pressure on. And uh, that's what the press the does. Well, but I, I, I think in the case of a Congress, uh, a governor or a president, they're trying to ap apply that pressure to an to, agenda uh, to an agenda that they have. I don't think. I think you know that the the mainstream media. You know, I mean, certainly there are media outlets with agendas, mm -hmm. and as I said earlier, increasingly the media, like you know, our society is getting more and more balkanized and divided along ideological lines. But yeah. I think the oh, the more traditional mainstream media is not going into a story, with, you know, or covering a institution with an agenda outside mm -hmm. of trying to make sure the public is, is, is as informed as possible about what, what that institution is doing it and the reasons they're doing it. So, and, and, and I think as a, and also as sort of, if you will, an offshoot of that, trying to make sure that if somebody in that institution is not acting in mm -hmm. a appropriate or ethical way to highlight that, because obviously these are ultimately people who are elected by the, the voters and the voters are entitled to know, I think, if somebody is, is acting in that manner. So you speak about the reasons that people are doing things, and, and as we near the end of this podcast, I'd like to ask the reasons that you've been doing your things, which is to say, why? Why you? Why put a lifetime, all the effort that you've done to hold power accountable for who? For the public. Does the public thank you? Sometimes they put you on stage, but... But why? What is it that drives you, that makes you think that you ought to be the person writing to hold power accountable, that, that, that it's something that's noble and worthwhile for you? Yeah. Well, as I said, I've always been interested in politics and government. And, uh, you know, well, I think I, I would call myself a skeptic. I'm certainly not cynical. You know, I believe certainly that in... Um, that most people operate from good motives. As I mm -hmm. said earlier, I think most members, most members of Congress, are hardworking, mm -hmm. you know, as, as are most members of the legislature. Yeah. And you know, in my desire, in terms of trying to do this, and I certainly don't hold myself out as some kind of beacon. You know, there are a lot of people doing this, and I think for some of the, hopefully for a lot of the same motivations that I have, is at the end of the day, I think that we all benefit as a society if. The public, when they go into the voting booth, mm -hmm. have as have as much information mm -hmm. as possible. What they do with that information, in terms of how they cast that vote, is up to them. But I think that we all benefit if, is whatever decision they do make, they're making it from a standpoint where they're informed, as opposed to acting on 
if, if you will, just whim or, you know, just a lack of information. So that has been Lou Peck of Bethesda Magazine, who speaks about the differences between a representative democracy and an informed representative democracy, where an electorate should be engaged, and in being engaged, they ought to make decisions based on having access to accurate information. Providing that information to the public is worthwhile for Lou because it holds power accountable, it enables democracy to function, and it serves uh, the dual f role of, 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 of educating and informing the public in addition to holding power accountable. And our democracy is reliant upon having a free press that informs the public so that they can make the correct decisions when deciding who should represent them in, in the halls of our nation's um, legislatures and, and executive uh, offices. So, uh, Lou, thank you for joining us. Thank you. This has been Episode 75 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time.